so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of the land we have recorded this podcast on, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. We pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures. It's late on a Thursday evening in September 1984, and 22-year-old Laurie Barros is leaving a job in San Diego, California. She's all dressed up and headed to a local drug dealer's house to hopefully do a few lines to make herself feel better. She's bored, lonely, and in the middle of a divorce from an abusive husband. She's keen to forget about it all, if only for a few hours. She parks and hops out of her car on a quiet, dark street. But within a few metres, she realises someone is following her. Within seconds, she's pulled into a chokehold, shoved into a vehicle and driven away. When the car finally stops on a deserted dirt road, a terrified lorry is pushed into the back seat by a man. He puts his hands around her neck and starts pressing. Swallow, he tells her. I love it when you swallow. As lorry falls in and out of consciousness, she plays dead. It's a move that will save her life. She's pushed out of the car, and lands amongst a pile of trash on the side of the road. She stays still, completely still. And Sam Little drives away, thinking he's murdered another woman. It'll take three decades for police to uncover the extent of Sam's secrets, crimes that will grant him the title of the most prolific serial killer in US history. Laurie was one of the few survivors, But for the 93 women he killed, many remain unidentified. All we have of their story are the details of their faces, sketched in meticulous detail in jail cell portraits by the man who stole their last breath. She let me fill her throat while caressing it. And before I knew it, I uh, tied my hands around it and strangled it up. I'm Gemma Bath, and this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. Today's episode is about America's most prolific serial killer, Samuel Little, who over the course of almost four decades killed more than 90 women. Joining us to discuss his case is American journalist Gillian Lauren, who is the only journalist to extensively interview Sam Little. Gillian exchanged dozens of letters with Sam while he was in prison and spent hundreds of hours interviewing him over the phone and in person. Her efforts to gain his trust eventually led to Sam's confession. Before we do get into this conversation, please be aware that Gillian does detail the graphic, violent nature of Sam's crimes. I want to start with the murder of Carol Elford. What was Carol's significance in the Samuel Little case? Carol Alford is a woman who was actually the tipping point that got Deputy DA Beth Silverman to indict Sam Little for murder in the first degree. They had had two hits, two case-to-case DNA hits, Guadalupe Apodaca and Audrey Nelson. And those were from 1989. Now, two DNA hits, a match on two prostitutes, cold cases from the 80s, is not enough for most DAs to indict. And so Carol Alford was like the magic piece of the puzzle when they made that connection of the DNA that was still in Carol Alford's shirt to Sam Little, then they had three. They had three DNA hits, three almost identical MOs, and they knew that they had a serial killer. 
So you mentioned that there were two victims who were sex workers. Was that Sam's MO, that he would only target women working in that profession? Well, Carol was not. Carol was not a sex worker. Sam Little targeted prostitutes, women of color, drug addicts, you know, people in the margins. He would have said people in the shadows. He would say, I never touched anyone like you, any fancy New York journalist or college girls. Ted Bundy was stupid. You know, like I stayed on my side of town and they didn't care about these missing victims, and that's exactly why he chose them. Now, Carol Alford had traces of cocaine or a a residue of cocaine in her system, very little, and she was a mother struggling and living in South L.A. She had, you know, some substance abuse problems, and he strangled her in the car, which is what he usually did. He would call his car his killing fields. And his MO was almost essentially strangulation, unless there was some crazy reason he had to use blunt force trauma or somebody started to fight him back. But, I mean, strangulation was his sex. Strangulation was his MO. What else do we know about his MO? Samuel Little drove across the country and back for almost four decades, sometimes with his longtime girlfriend, Jean. He would stop in the areas of town where you could find drugs and prostitutes, and he would go cruising the streets at night. He would pick up a woman. Sometimes he'd spend more time with them. Sometimes he'd kill them right away, but he'd generally drive them to a secluded place. Either he would beat them, sexually assault them or not. Sometimes he did, sometimes he didn't. There was sort of a famous punch to the back of the head that would sort of immobilize his victims. And generally they were prostitutes, so they were already engaged in a sexual act. They were like already in a compromised position once he began to strangle them. He would usually strangle them in the car. There are some exceptions to that. And he often dumped them in a trash barrel, in a staircase, in a pile of weeds, in a pile of tires. He didn't work too hard to hide the bodies because he didn't think people would really care. And I mean, you don't have to look too hard for the metaphor of he really did think they were trash. I mean, he will describe them as angels, his babies, we're all going to be together in heaven. He loves every one of them. He loves women. But, you know, he absolutely thought they were trash. But Sam was a creature of convenience. He was a pragmatist. He wasn't one of these serial killers who, you know save their hearts and stage their bodies or like he wanted the experience of robbing somebody of their breath and their life. He would let them come back and then strangle them again, let them come back and then strangle them again. Several times he even administered CPR. You know, he just wanted their ultimate submission And that was the only way he could have an orgasm. I mean, occasionally he could have sex with women, but only if he thought about killing them. So then the women that he stayed with long term or he loved and he he didn't kill, he couldn't have sex with because he thought it was wrong to think about killing them after a certain point. You interviewed some family members of Guadalupe and Audrey. What did you find out about their lives before encountering Sam Little? Guadalupe was a straight gangster. They told me she used to smuggle drugs into prison to her boyfriend under like Lee Press-On nails. Oh, wow. Uh Uh-huh. And then she would pull off the nails, take the drugs out from around the nails, stick it on the bottom of the table. Okay. Quite the entrepreneur. What about Audrey? I talked to her daughter, Pearl Unique Nelson. 
She was originally named Unique, then was adopted by her grandparents because her mother was unable to take care of her due to her drug habit. So when I was talking to Pearl Unique, you know, and she just described Audrey as this, she was this incredibly creative, sparkling, like great at everything she did and wild and reckless. And she was raised on a farm outside of New York City, no TV, no media, no music, no dancing, no nothing, very, very strict and she was rebellious. She was an artist. She got messed up with the wrong guy right away as soon as she moved to New York and then started working as a high-class escort. And I went downhill from there until in 1987, Samuel Little picked her up and his Thunderbird off of the streets of downtown L.A., murdered her and left her in a dumpster behind a Chinese restaurant. At the time in the 80s, was much done about their deaths? Were there many investigations into what happened to them at the time? Well, it's hard to make a blanket statement about this. There's a conception that, you know, that these victims were ignored across the board. I think it it depended on the detective, but they certainly weren't given the same attention as said, like, you know, there's a spectrum. There's only limited resources that a police department has. Now, you know, where is the media attention going to go? Where is the departmental resources going to go? You know, at the same time that I was doing all this research on Sam's victims who were largely ignored, they didn't have DNA at the time. I mean, they they knew about DNA. They did not yet have DNA fingerprinting, nor a comprehensive national index. So there was no way to match it up. You know, like communication between jurisdictions becomes so important when you have somebody like a serial killer or a stranger killer who may be moving through many, many states. So there was none of that. You know, there were just a couple of leads that went nowhere. And, you know, within weeks, all of those cases went cold. So how they got picked up again was there was a grant from the Department of Justice given to the Cold Case Homicide Unit, which I think at that point was called the Cold Case Special Section. And they were given a grant to screen old cases for DNA to go and rescreen that evidence. Now the LAPD happens to keep their evidence. I mean, we're a large city. There are some cities that are small. There's no place for it. Evidence gets discarded. You know, we keep our evidence very meticulously here. So they were able to run that evidence and with the new technology connected to Sam. And this is the early 2000s by that point. So Decades later. Yeah, 30 years later. Mm -hmm. So they managed to get the name Samuel Little from these fingerprints. What did the police know about him at the time? Well, what the police knew about him is mind-boggling. I mean, there isn't the police, first of all. Just like I'm saying, the big problem with a lot of this is there's no mandated reporting of sort of behavioral patterns of crimes. I mean, there is something called the VICAP system, the Violent Criminal Apprehension System. That's the best we've got, but it's not mandated. It's voluntary. So you have to have a cop who sits down, you know, with only so many hours in a day and voluntarily says, okay, I'm going to enter this into the system. It seems like a stranger murder. It seems like a serial murder. It, you know, it's important that it be connected, you know, over a national indexing system. Now, many, many people would like love to see VICAP mandated. Canada has a program that does incredibly well, ViClass, that is a mandated behavioral pattern program. So what cops kind of everywhere knew about Sam, but they weren't talking to each other, that he was a petty criminal. He was picked up 
every other day for shoplifting. I have never seen a rap sheet like this before. The first time I saw it, I cried. Like I was astounded because not only was he picked up and released again and again and again for stealing a steak at a Walmart, right? Mm. But he was killing people at night and assaulting. He said it was like theft by day, murder by night. He said he was hiding in plain sight. You know, he's getting arrested all the time. It was just wasn't for the murders. But then he did. He was arrested and a grand jury failed to indict him for the murder of Melinda LaPree in Pascagoula. And then he was tried again for the murder of Patricia Mount in Alachua, Florida. And he was acquitted by a jury of his peers. He was tried again in San Diego where they had two living victims to testify. And he served 18 months for, I mean, it was, it was attempted murder. He thought they were dead. One, he was caught in the act. And then Lori Carriage, Lori Barros at the time, who is very much alive and thriving now, he thought she was dead. He served 18 months for that, got out, drove to LA to his girlfriend Jean's house, and killed two women in one night the next night. So it was such a failure of the criminal justice system. It's just absolutely mind rattling. And yes, in large part, I think it was because the witnesses weren't credible. They were prostitutes. They were drug addicts. They weren't credible. I mean, some of the most credible eyewitness testimony I've ever read, Lori, is honestly, I was just like, wow, I cannot believe in a moment of trauma you remembered all that, you know. But if these women aren't credible witnesses, how is he a credible witness with all of these things on his rap sheet? Well, he's not a witness. Yeah. That's the thing. And he is innocent until proven guilty. There must be a presumption of innocence. It's due process. So if there is a reasonable doubt, if they can establish a reasonable doubt, they have to acquit him. I mean, a grand jury didn't even indict him for Melinda Lipri's murder where there were two eyewitnesses were able to pick him out of an eight pack. You know, it was the perfect MO, you know, they didn't care. They didn't want to go through. I mean, it's expensive. It's time consuming, you know, to a trial is a big pain for everyone. And Sergeant Lieutenant Detective Darren Versaga now, who's a wonderful detective in Pascagoula, Mississippi, and introduced me to Hilda, one of the victims, and took me around. And he told me, you know, I'm ashamed to say it. But in the late 80s in Mississippi, you couldn't commit a crime against a black prostitute. It just wasn't considered a crime. And I think the important thing to say is that Sam knew all of this. He worked to this. He worked the system brilliantly, brilliantly for decades. You're listening to True Crime Conversations with me, Gemma Barth. I'm speaking with journalist Gillian Lauren about American serial killer Sam Little. I want to go into Sam's childhood for a second because you've done extensive research into his background. Are there any kind of insights that you can share about how he became like this? I mean, that's always the question, right? Like what makes a serial killer? And, you know, I think there are some very concrete answers to that. And then there's this mysterious piece, You know, because I'm going to tell you all the things and then someone's going to say, yeah, but all those things happened to me and I didn't go kill 93 people. And it's like, well, that's the mysterious piece. So there was intrauterine trauma. His mother tried to abort him unsuccessfully many times. He was neglected terribly as an infant and a child. His birth mother, Bessie May, was 16. She was put out of the house. 
She left him in the rain to die. So his paternal grandparents raised him, but told him that they were his parents. He was definitely sexually abused by an uncle. He was mainly, I would say, neglected. You know, like they were grandparents. They were done having kids. So he started to kind of do these little crimes, like steal car batteries and go sell them. And then he came up with this idea that he and two of his friends, they were 13, were going to get a bus, they were going to go to Oberlin College, and they were going to steal three bicycles. They did just that, and they made it two blocks before they were arrested. (laughs) And one of them got off, but two of them were sent to the Boys Industrial School in Lancaster, Ohio. Now, the Boys Industrial School is now quite famous for the abuse. It was like a military juvenile detention center. And I mean, I just think it was terrifying place where he got all kinds of messed up. And then, you know, he came home and he had decided that a life of crime sounded really good because he'd been hanging out with people who made it sound really good. And he wanted to be a pimp. He didn't, you know, want to go work at the steel factory. So he wound himself back in jail in a couple of months. And this time he was in the Ohio State Reformatory, which is also famously a brutal institution. You can see in Shawshank Redemption. It's actually the prison in Shawshank Redemption. Yeah, so, I mean, he spent, from when he was 13 to when he was 25, pretty much incarcerated. And this desire that he had to strangle people started quite early as well, didn't it? It did. So I think all these things, they're just like a braid, and you can't tease one piece away from another. Like, what made him so interested in strangulation? Well... You know, it took me a long time to hear from him that, well, before he ever started fantasizing about strangling women, he was strangling himself. He was, uh, like, doing autoerotic asphyxiation. You know, he was always obsessed with necks. He really resented, like, pretty white girls. He thought they treated him like a dog. So he would have these fantasies about hurting them. And there's one in particular named Carol Messenger, kindergarten. She was the first person. He started to look at her neck. And then in second grade, he had a teacher. And he would get fixated on these certain necks. And then he got into detective magazines. I don't know if you've ever seen like True Detective or Inside Detective magazine, these magazines from the 50s that were essentially pornography, like violent pornography. And he read about this woman, Gloria Ferry, and he got obsessed with her picture, and she had been strangled to death and left in the park. And Gloria Ferry became his, you know, icon. So it wasn't until 2014, and he's an old man, that he actually gets convicted of these three women's murders that we talked about at the top. Did he deny those murders at the start? Oh, he denied them till the very end. Those were like the last three where I was just like, enough already, please. You know, they framed him. They framed him. The lie, those liars, those dogs, those cheaters, they framed me. And he had a whole thing about the LAPD and his upside down case. And, you know, just because DNA was on all three of these women just means he's a very unlucky guy. He was just in... Three of these places, that just means he was there. Doesn't mean he killed them. And, you know, and he was like still, even when he was already confessing about the crimes to me, even when he had already told me he was a murderer, he would still hold out on those. And also, I think my aunt's a psychiatrist who is sort of a famous diagnostician and has worked at Harvard and Mass General her whole life. And, She said, you know, he may not be able at this point to tease apart the truth from the lies. So don't expect it to happen quickly. I'd love you to tell me about the first time you met Sam. What was that like? Meeting Sam was 
an incredible experience. Yeah, I'd never been to men's maximum security prison before. We get in, I get my little slip, my thing, and it's so nerve wracking. And there's so many rules. I was expecting like what you see in the movies where you pick up a phone and talk to the glass and no family visitor room. So Sam was in a wheelchair and he came from behind me. So he just rolled up right next to me and was like, you, you, you're my angels come from heaven. And he was like a foot from my face. And I had gotten a bunch of like donuts and little Debbie cakes and Funyuns and Coca-Cola. I didn't know what he liked. So I just sort of, you know, served him food and started talking. And that whole first day, he denied everything. So meeting Sam was not dramatic the first day. He just, he, like, he looked like a ghost to me. He, he looked so empty. There was something very, even though he was friendly and charming and bright, immediately something was not there. And this was 2018, wasn't it? So he was well into his 70s by now. Yes. So he was in prison for these three murders and over time he started confessing about more to you. How did you gain his trust for him to start doing that? Well, I mean, I told him I was a journalist from the very first time I wrote him and, uh, you know, I didn't push you know, I just said I was just really interested. I wanted to hear his side of the story. You know, I wasn't here to judge him. I wanted to be impartial. I felt like he was really misrepresented in the media. I didn't think he got enough attention. You know, I just like went for all the flattery. So it was, it was actually the second day I went in that I got him to confess. And it was a pretty great moment. You know, I mean, I had just like worn him down a little bit and, you know, established rapport. I didn't like go straight for the murders, but I, I told him, you know, I was interested in violent behavior. I was interested in criminal deviance. I thought that probably he was a, a you know, outstanding example of this and, you know, hadn't been recognized enough. So really playing up to his ego so he would trust you. How did you feel when he opened up and confessed to his crimes? In the beginning, it was scary and it was really exciting. It was really disturbing. It spiraled, though. I mean, to like kind of get that confession, that incredible hit of adrenaline. I, I mean, like I can't deny that that like was an incredibly exciting moment. Mm. And then you realize like it's one of those situations like be careful what you ask for. You know, and then my next four years of my life and my family's life was murder, 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 murder. Well, you had almost daily contact with him over the phone and regular visits as well as letters where he's calling you baby doll and angel. I was his daughter. I was his wife. I was his mother. I was his soulmate. You know, we were going to live all in a palace with his other babies together in heaven. Like he called his victims his babies. So how many murders did he actually confess to you about? Let me see. 26. And at that point, I was talking to the police. I mean, I was talking to the police right away. So let's see. How did this conversation go? Oh, you know, he wants stuff, right? So, well, you sent me some little Debbie cakes. And then, he, you know, he gives you the name of the place where you order the stuff at the prison. He goes, you know what I really want? I want a TV. And you can buy a TV for the inmates. And uh, I was like, well, I want things too, Sam. So he confessed to murder for a TV. I think it was also for a friend. 
he wanted a friend, you know? I mean, my deal with him eventually was that I wouldn't let him die alone. I'd be his friend for the rest of his life, book or no book, if he would just tell me what he did, tell me the truth, the best of his ability. Sometimes he did, and sometimes he lied, sometimes he messed with me, you know? But to the best of his ability, I believe by the end of the time we were working together, he was really doing his best. How did it blow out from 26 confessions to you to 93 murders? Well, because my confessions aren't the official confession. You know, they're just pieces of journalism. And then, of course, I'm going to, you know, if somebody is confessing a crime to me, you know, a murder that's not solved an open case, I'm going to contact law enforcement about that. And he knew that very well, even though he would still have paranoid fits about it. Like, are you working for the police? Are you going to tell the police? And I was just like, Sam, you know, I'm writing a book about this, right? You know, but I was like, yes, I am telling the police these things. And I started, you know, communicating with police and with uh, this Texas Ranger, Texas Ranger James Holland, who is this serial killer whisperer of a Texas Ranger. And he indeed has gotten confessions out of many murderers. And he needed a Texas case in order to interview Sam. And the FBI went back over the investigative matrix that they had done the first time they got Sam. And they found a Texas case, Denise Brothers, in 1994. And so that gave him his in. And he went to LA and started interviewing Sam. He called him Sammy. Jimmy started interviewing Sammy, and Sammy really went for it. Well, he ended up confessing to 93 murders. Me and Jimmy were his only friends or his best friends. And, you know, and Jim gave him a lot of incentive and, you know, has some pretty unconventional interviewing techniques that some people like and some people don't. I also have unconventional interviewing techniques. Like you were saying, you know, he calls me baby doll. He calls me this, he calls me that. You know, I mean, you know, people criticize that, you know, because I call him Big Daddy and I called him Mr. Sam. And, you know, and he required a level of submission. And flattery. Yeah, flattery all the time. But also, you know, for instance, I was asking him a question. He didn't like women talking too long. And he was just like, shut your mouth or I am going to crawl through this phone and eat your fucking lips off. Wow. And I said, oh my gosh, no, 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 I'm just a little kitty cat. I'm just a little kitty. I'm I'm not saying anything. You talk, you know? And later on, you know, the FBI was like, you know, what kind of reporter are you? You're like, I'm a little kitty cat. I'm I'm just like a scared one who just pissed off a serial killer. Like I was being as submissive as I could possibly be. Yeah. You know, and calming him down and it worked. And, uh, you know, and I can just continue to really make him feel real, like his self-concept around the confessions. I tried to really build it up and make him a hero, you know, like you're a hero for doing this. So I think that while I did solve one of the murders from the ground up and give the like pivotal details that just hadn't turned up in some of the other interviews that I got, they were able to locate these victims. It was more that I encouraged him and like followed the confessions and was able to hear the strange detail and then relay it to the cops. You know, it was definitely a group effort of people all across the country. I think what perplexes me about him as well with so many murders is how much he remembers of each incident, like he seems to be able to recall a lot of what he did to these particular women, and there are so many women. I mean, some in the 80s when he was like way into crack get a little muddled 
to where I feel maybe two of the victims might be the same person or things like that. But especially the early murders are pristine. His memory is incredible. And also he's an artist. He draws his victims. So that was part of how they were able to match some of the confessions. You know, they were able to show these pictures and some would say that looks like my aunt, you know, who went missing at this time. So we don't know who a lot of these women are, do we? No, not we really don't. I mean, I have a list here of the victims solved and unsolved. And like the really heartbreaking part is the unknown, 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 unknown. You know, and that's not acceptable to me. It doesn't mean I can find every one of Sam's victims or that I want to spend the rest of my life on Sam Little, but I am devoted to, you know, to marginalized victims and I'm passionate about cold cases. So I will continue to pursue them, Sam's and others. Sam died in 2020, so you are no longer having these conversations with him. And when you look back at the relationship that you formed with him, what do you think of him as a man, as a serial killer, as a person? I mean, I would say it's one of the most defining relationships of my life, for better or worse. It didn't ruin me, you know, like it didn't ruin my faith. It didn't ruin my curiosity and and belief in humanity. Someone asked me, I couldn't believe they were the only person that asked me this question. It was like my babysitter the other day. I said, do you miss him? Mm. And I mean, for what he put me through, I, I hated his guts, you know, but I was so involved in this case. It took all my time. It took everything from me. For years, like, he was sort of my only friend. You know, I was talking to him on the phone every day. When do I talk to my best friend? Once a month? So I don't miss him. What I miss is the sense of purpose. I miss the adventure he took me on. You know, I went to Pascagoula, Mississippi and Lorain, Ohio and and met all these incredible people in Odessa, Texas. And I miss the hunt. But when I got that call and they said Samuel died of COVID-related complications and you're his next of kin. Oh, wow. I know. He's in my garage right now. I still don't know what to do with him. That's really heavy. You've got a serial killer's remains in your garage. The sad part of the story was I had arranged to have his brain donated to the top neuroscientists in the country at UC Irvine and at Stanford. And even though I was his next of kin, you know, he was Sam. He filled out the paperwork wrong. He did this. He did that, you know. And that brain went to waste and they cremated his body before there was any autopsy or anything. Because I feel like when someone like this exists in the world who has done such evil, if anything, can't we learn from them? Can't we learn something? Exactly. I mean, I had those professors calling the coroner. I mean, that was my argument. Like, please, like, let's turn a sow's ear into a silk purse here and let them study this brain. But the bureaucracy and and COVID at the time. I mean, they did have the meat trucks out, you know, with bodies in front of the coroner's office then because there wasn't any room. So, I mean, it happened how it happened. It's, It's a shame, but, you know, there've been many more solves over the last year. And hopefully this will just shine a light on these marginalized victims and cold cases and, maybe a lot of different ways to go at them, you know, like citizen detectives are doing really amazing work right now. And I think that the more captivated you can get people, you know, maybe the more involved they'll want to be. Gillian, was Sam Little or is Sam Little one of the worst serial killers we've ever seen? I'm not sure what makes a serial killer 
worse or better. You know, I have friends who are cops who say the press doesn't even care unless it's five. Unless they have five victims. They have three victims where they're like, eh. So the 93 victims, I mean, whether it's 91 or 93, I mean, it's about that. And it's hard to wrap your mind around. And I don't think that makes him worse or better. Or, you know, I think, you know, these people who kill for pleasure and are sexually motivated serial killers. I mean, one person is as bad as 93 people. Like, you know, everybody counts or nobody counts. So I think that in this case, hopefully law enforcement is making a shift more toward that direction. Thanks to Gillian for assisting us to tell this story. If you'd like to learn more about her work on this case, you can stream Confronting a Serial Killer on Stan. Gillian's also writing a book about her time with Sam Little and the details of his crimes, which will be released next year. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted by me, Gemma Bath, with audio design by Madeline Joannou. The executive producer is Gia Moylan. Thanks for listening. I'll be back next week with another True Crime Conversation.